Yeah, it's almost 11 now. Yes, sir. Dr. Laul, can we start? It was, good morning, all. Uh, our today's, uh, today's program moderator is Dr. Nupur Mittal. So I'm requesting Dr. Nupur Mittal uh, to introduce Dr. Datta Panandekar, sir. Our secretary is of the audience. Thank you, Nilesh. And good morning to everybody. A very warm welcome to all of you to the seventh webinar hosted by the Thane Obstetrical and Gynecological Society on IUI optimizing results. I thank our respected president, Dr. Rajiv Laud, for giving me this opportunity to moderate the seminar. And I now invite our dynamic secretary, Dr. Datta Panandikar, to introduce to us our esteemed speaker, Dr. Narhari. Dr. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome to webinar number seven. We have a very eminent uh, ART consultant today, uh, Dr. Narahari Malgaukar. He is based in Nashik. He started his first center in Nashik, known by his famous brand, Progenesis. He has now uh, offshooted to Thane and to Pune also. Uh, he is very well known in this field and is working in this field for the last 10 years. He was awarded at, as uh, an international award as the world's greatest leader in 2016-17 by URS Asia 1 at Dubai. His center has won the Icon of Healthcare Best Center Award in Reproductive Medicine at Nashik. He is a proud member of a a ASRM, Ashray and Isar. And he loves to include technology and innovations in his, in his practice. And we can see it at his clinics which, which are there. So with these words, I request Dr. Narari Malgaukar to take over and, and give his presentation. Nilesh, you have to mute. Yes, sir. Mute all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. First, I would like to say thanks to Thane Organic Society, particularly to Dr. Raju Lau, Dr. Datta Panandika, sir. And Dr. Uh, Nupur Madam is also there. And I would like to thanks to Nivan Pharma to arrange this webinar. So today's topic is a very basic topics and uh, that practice is done by each and every gynecologist into day to day practice. That is the IUI. But when we are doing the IUI, when we are seeing that the results are not that promising. So why the results are so less in the IUI? So today we are going to see about how we can optimize the result in IUI and what different things we can do for the betterment of the result in IUI. So today's presentation is optimizing the IUI results. So how we can do? So to optimize the IUI result, it is very important to look after the, all the factors. So this is the first slide. I'm going to cover all the topics one by one. These are very important. And the first important thing is the selection and work of the patient is the most important uh, first point to optimize the IUI result, followed by ovulation induction protocols. So for different patients, we should have a different, different protocols. So there should not be a single protocol to all patients. So there are a number of factors by which can decide. So which protocol has to be used for the which patient. And the next is the after stimulation, the monitoring is very, very important. So. I'm more focused in this presentation on the monitoring of the stimulated cycle, how we can use the new gadgets to monitor the in induced cycle. And after monitoring the timing of ovulation trigger, so number of doctors, they are very much confused when to give exactly trigger and what are the points we, are, we should look before giving triggers. So I'm going to cover that also in this topic. Then the timing of IUI, after how many hours of the trigger we should do the IUI, whether to do the single IUI, double IUI. So that confusion also, I'm going to uh, solve from this presentation after timing of the IUI, the cement washing techniques, so as I say, so different cementopathy needs a different washing techniques. So we'll cover those part also into this and the IUI procedure, the technical details to do the IUI. So after that, the last is a luteal phase support. So these are the points we are going to cover in this presentation and each and every point is very important if you want to do the good IUI if you want to optimize the result in IUI. 
So first we should know what is IUI. That is very important as it is a direct placement of the process. It's a very important process. We cannot do direct cement uh, insemination. The process highly motile concentrated sperm washed free of seminal plasma and other debris into the uterus as close to the ovulatory oocyte as possible. So there are two things because of this. So reduces the distance to travel and second, there are more spermatozoa available for the fertilization. So the first point uh, in our lecture is the selection and work of the patient. So it's very important to select the right patient for the right treatment. So it's the first secret of IUS success. If you select a proper patient, then it is the first step towards the success of the IUI. So what points we need to consider while selecting the patient? It is very important, as I say, age of the female is very important because as the age increases, there is decrease in the chances of success. So after 35, the ovarian reserve has gone down drastically and leads to a, a infertility. The next one is very important to see the duration of infertility. Uh, whether she is married, newly married, or she is married more than five years, as the duration of infertility increases, the chances of success has gone down. Then next is the number of previously done IUI cycles, so also very important. As the number of IUI cycles, so normally the new guidelines of ASRM also has been there. So three to four IUI are sufficient to get a result. If not getting the result, you have to move towards the IVF. So if there is a previous IUI cycle done properly, this is very important, these things properly done, previous IUI cycles, if it is there, the chances of further cycle is decreased. The next is the semen parameters. So semen parameters, many times it is the most neglected part because the number of gynecologists, they are not doing seminal analysis at their center. So they are relying on the other's pathologies and the reports are not that much reliable. So semen parameters, we have to look whether there is any oligoestinoteratosospermia is there or not. And the next is the cause of infertility. We should know the cause of infertility before starting with the IUI, whether there is a male factor, whether there is a female factor or the combined factor is there or not. So before selection, so we have to consider these points and after considering these points, we'll have to move ahead with the things. So then we'll come to know the, what are the indications of the IUI? So now couple is there. So what are the indications? It's very important, the female factor, male factor, and we had divided into three. Third one is the donor IUI. So female factor, if there is a cervical problem, as I say cervical problem, if there is cervical stenosis or previous sleep surgery or anti-sperm antibodies in the cervix, then ovulatory dysfunction is very common, WHO category 1 and WHO category 2. So those are the links to an ovulation and again, we need to go ahead with the IUI. Unexplained infertility, all the parameters are normal, they are trying naturally but unable to conceive. In that condition, again, IUI gives a good results. Minimum endometriosis, so minimal means stage 1 and stage 2 endometriosis. Yes, you can definitely try IUI, but for the stage 3 and stage 4 endometriosis, IUI will not give you a good results. Then as I say, anti sperm antibodies in the cervix and psychological and psychogenic sexual dysfunction. So nowadays we are seeing number of uh, couples, they are coming to us, they are having the intercourse problem, vaginismus and there are number of psychological problems also. So in that condition, without relation, if they don't want to conceive, then we have to go ahead with the IUI. And then the male factors, what are the indications? If there is an anatomical defect in the penis, that is something called as hypopedias is if there or again a sexual or ejaculatory dysfunction as i say premature ejaculation is there if sometimes retrograde ejaculation is there so in that condition iui we can go ahead with the iui then again the importance of the coital problems immunological problems in the spermatozoa as i say if there is anti sperm antibodies are there so there is a of of the spermatozoa and that drastically decreases the motility of the sperm so in that condition we can go ahead with the iui then increase viscosity if the sample is too much viscous and again there is decrease in the motility and reduces the result in the natural conception. So IUI is one of the option in such condition. Oligoestenoteratosuspermia. Everybody knows about this oligoestenoteratosuspermia. So in this condition, so is as I say, total motile sperm fraction is very important. If it is more than 5 million, then we can go ahead with the IUI. If it is less than 5 million, then the IVF and if it is less than 1 million, the X is the right choice in such condition. So if there's a mild factor, so then IUI gives a good result. The same with the sperm cryopreservation prior to treatment of the cancer surgery or the discordant HIV couples. The husband is positive and the uh, wife is negative. Again, in that condition, we can offer the IUI with the good results. So next is the donor semen IUI. As I say, azuspermia is very important. Azuspermia, but that is of the testicular cause. 
So if there is pre-testicular osteopenia, post-testicular osteopenia, so other treatment of modalities are there. There is no need to use a donor cement. If there is a severe abnormal sperm cement parameters, so in that condition, the patient don't want the IVF and the advanced modality like ICSI, IMSI or PICSI. So in that condition, we can offer the donor IUI or hereditary diseases in the men. Again, it's an indication. The severe untreatable RH isoimmunization in wife. So again, if they want a good baby, so in that condition, we can take a donor semen that is RH negative blood group and we can offer them a good success rate with a good normal baby. Then repeated failure in the IVF or ICSI. So there are a number of cases we are seeing sometimes. If there is a repeated failure in that condition, we can offer them the donor IUI. Or nowadays, a modern indication, as we say, is a single woman or lesbian couple, they want the baby without marriage. In that condition also, we can offer them the IUI. So this is the indication. So we have selected the patient with this indication. Now, how to investigate? So don't directly do the IUI without investigation. So I have divided here the investigation in two parts. It's the essential investigation and the second is the optional investigation. So essential investigations are basic investigation you should do before going ahead with the IUI. That is a hormonal profile, a minimum TSH and prolactin should be done. Then transvaginal sonography is very important. So as I say, it is the most important gadget in the for the gynecologist to do the uh, any kind of ART or the IUI. So transvaginal sonography, you should do the hysterosalpingography or the sonosalpingography before starting with the IUI and the viral markers should be done. These are the essential investigation and option investigation. If that patient is a polycystic ovary, then you can do the day two FSH, LH or blood sugar. You can do the fasting insulin. If poor ovarian reserve, you can do the AMH. And if there is, you are finding some abnormalities in the HAG or you are suspecting some cyst, and then do the laparoscopy. And if the tubal patency is there after laparoscopy, you can go ahead with the IUI. So those are basic essential and the option investigation you should do before starting with the IUI. Then the investigation of male part, as we say. So male part, the only semen analysis and viral markers are sufficient. If the semen analysis is normal, there is no need to do any advanced test. If there is a problem in the semen analysis, as I say, so you can do the hormonal evaluation, like you can do the FSH, you can do the testosterone, you can offer the sperm function test, sperm survival test, sperm DNA fragmentation index, if there is a problem in the these things, or if there is an erectile problem or the ejaculatory problems, you can do the blood sugar or the prolactin level. Those are the optional investigation, but the essential investigation is the semen analysis. So you should do these minimum investigation before going ahead with the IUI. So this is about the first part, what I, I talked about the selection and workup of the patient. So select a proper candidate, work up the candidate, and then go ahead with the next step that is the ovulation induction protocols. So what protocols we should do and what is the goal of ovulation induction is very important. So goal should be maximize the beneficial effect in terms of single live birth at term and minimize the complication like cancellation rate because of the hyperstimulation or the multiple pregnancy or the OHSS. So this should be the goal while you are stimulating the patient. So how we can optimize the, uh, this ovulation induction? So choice of protocol is very important. As I said, different protocol for different patients depends on their response, depends on their ovarian reserve depends on the cause of infertility. Then response assessment, once you started with the stimulation, so how that patient is responding, whether it's a poor responder, whether it's a high, normal responder or a high responder. So you have to assess that response and accordingly you have to change the dose of the gonadotropies. And addition of other measures, if something is there, you can add into the, uh, that uh, particular treatment part. So what are the predictive factors for the assessment of ovulation inductions? It's very important. As we say, the three A's, what you should remember, that is the antral follicular count is very important, AMH and age of the patient. These are the three very important parameters you have to first see, and accordingly you can start with the stimulation. And along with that, the BMI, if obesity is there, and the FSA level is not that useful nowadays. So these three factors we have to consider, and accordingly we can start with the stimulation protocol. So what are the all drugs are there for the stimulation protocol? So there are a number of drugs available like clomiphene citrate, so everybody is using clomiphene citrate, aromatase inhibitors are there. Number of gonadotropins are there, urinary gonadotropins, highly purified, recombinant FSH, urinary FSH, recombinant LH, GNRH analogs like agonist, antagonist are there. So this can be used for the ovulation induction. 
So now we'll go one by one. So how we can use these uh, medications for the ovulation induction, particularly in the IUI. I'm not going to talk about the IVF part now. So only what kind of protocols we have to use for the IUI. So basically the clomiphene citrate, everybody should know the mechanism of clomiphene citrate is very important. So it blocks the estrogen receptor at the level of hypothalamus pituitary. So depletion, there is a negative feedback effect of the estrogen. And because of that, there is a increase in the, it blocks the negative feedback. So increase in the GnRH uh, frequency and there is increase in the FSH release. So this is a normal mechanism of the clomiphene citrate. So what are the indications when we need to use the clomiphene citrate? As I say, unovulated cycles, maybe WHO category one patients or WHO category two patients. Infrequent ovulation, the mainly polycystic ovaries, they're having the uh, irregular menses and all those things. Inadequate corpus luteum function. So how we can say it is inadequate corpus luteum function? There are two kinds of things. One, clinically we can judge that. So by means of if the patient is giving the history of short cycles, if the patient is having the premenstrual spotting, so in that condition, we can say the corpus luteum is not functioning properly. And by the biochemical test, like that we can do the progesterone level after the rupture of the follicles at seven days. So that means we can see if there is an inadequate corpus luteum function. We can use the clomiphene citrate, polycystic ovary, and unexplained infertility. All the parameters are normal, and you can start with the clomiphene citrate. Then how we can use this clomiphene citrate? So basic stimulation protocol, start with the 50 milligram per day for five days. You can start from second or third day of the cycles and continue for five days. And you can monitor this, uh, these cycles. And once the dominant follicle is around 18, 20, you can give the SG trigger and you can go ahead with the IUI. So this is a, a figure which will tell you about how we can proceed with the clomiphene citrate. Starting dose should be 50 milligram per day. If there is ovulation, so you can do the two to three cycles with the same dose. If there is no pregnancy, use the gonadotropins. If there is a suboptimal endometrium, even the follicles are uh, ready, the rupturing the follicles, but endometrium is not proper. Again, you have to use the gonadotropins. If there is no ovulation with the 50 milligram, next cycle you can go ahead with, and you can use 100 milligram. The same if ovulation is there, you can use the same protocol. If there is no ovulation, maximum dose you can increase up to 150 milligram per day. And if still there is no ovulation, you have to use the gonadotropins. As I say, there is a WHO category one that is hypogonadotropic hypogonadism patient. You cannot use the clomiphene citrate in that condition. You have to use the gonadotropins only. So this figure, you have to note down the things. So maximum dose of clomiphene should be 150 milligram per day because it is having the peripheral anti-estrogenic effect. So if you're using the more dose, even though there is an ovulation, but the pregnancy rate will be on the lower side. So everybody should know the result of clomiphene citrates. As I say, almost 70% patient ovulate and only 40% becomes pregnant. As I say, why this, a, this difference after ovulation and the pregnancy? So that is because of the peripheral anti-estrogenic effect of the clomiphene citrate. That is a poor quality of cervical mucus, poor quality of endometrium, the thickness. So that is the main reason for the decrease in the chances of the pregnancy or implantation. 5% multiple pregnancies are there. And as I say, it's very important, 60% conceived during the first three cycles. So, so take it in the, your mind that the first three to four cycles are very important as ASRM guidelines also in 2019, they are saying only three to four IUI is more than sufficient. If patient unable to conceive, then you have to move ahead with the IVF. So, so these are about the clomiphene citrate. The next drug is aromatase inhibitors. So nowadays what we are using is a selective aromatase inhibitors which inhibits the conversion of androstenodion into the estrone and testosterone into the estradiol. So everybody knows about the letrazone and anastrozole drugs, what we are using for the induction as aromatase inhibitors. Those are selective aromatase inhibitors. So ovulation induction in unovulatory infertility is mainly an indication. Or sometimes if there is a CC resistance, so we cannot able to uh, develop the follicle with the clomiphene citrate or CC failure, clomiphene citrate failure. The patient is ovulating but unable to conceive. So in that condition for monofollicular growth, we can use the letrazole and anastrozole. The induction is the same, it's 2.5 milligram once or twice a day for five days and you can monitor the cycle after the in ninth or 10th day of the menstrual cycle. And once the dominant follicle is there, you can give the trigger and you can do the IUI. When we are seeing the result, so difference in the result. So clomiphene, this is a study showing the analysis between the letrozole and the clomiphene citrate. So when you are seeing the ovulation rate is pretty low with the letrozole, 
and that is 38% with at compared with the clomiphene that is almost 65% when you are seeing the clinical pregnancy rate so there is no statistical significant difference between the clinical pregnancy rate between the letrozole and the clomiphene so almost you can use either of the agent for the induction of the ovulation so this is about the clomiphene then we talked about the aromatase inhibitors then next is the injectable gonadotropin so number of doctors they won't use the injectable gonadotropin because of some stigma so i'm going to tell the basic things in this stimulation protocol what are the basic things we can do without increasing the complications or without increasing the chances of ohss so indications is a simple failure to respond with the anti estrogenic therapy as i say anti estrogenic therapy at least three cycles of cc and no ovulation that is something called as a clomiphene resistance so should not increase the dose and go ahead with again clomiphene so 150 is the maximum dose you can use or at least three ovulatory cycles were unable to conceive so that is something called as a clomiphene failure so ovulation is there but there but the patient is unable to conceive in this condition we have to use the gonadotropins for the next cycle if there is a side effect of anti estrogenic therapy irrespective of ovulation so even the ovulation is there but the suboptimum endometrium is there in that condition gonadotropins gives you the best result two or more miscarriages with the cc therapy again gonadotropins gives you good results and as i say who category 1 like hypogonadotropic hypogonadic patient is there so in that condition again we can use the gonadotropins so these are the basic indications where we can use the gonadotropins so before going ahead with the stimulation so concept we should know the basic concept of the normal physiology of the ovulation so there are three phases of the ovulation the early follicular phase that is day 1 2 and 3 so this is there is a more fsh is essential during this phase for the recruitment of the follicles and small amount of lh which is endogenous is there which is also sufficient then the mid follicular phase that is day 5 day 6 or day 7 so in that condition a dominant follicle is selected and it has a both fsh and as well as lh receptors during this phase and the third one is a late follicular phase that is day 6 to day 12 so in this condition dominant follicle has a is a lh dependent now and it start producing the estradiol and in absence of fsh and dominance of lhs so there is a follicular atresia of the follicles and we get a monofollicular development so this is a normal in the natural pregnancy this is the normal ovulation physiology we should understand this thing and accordingly we can do the stimulation so so this is a very basic protocol i'm going to talk about this is something called as a soft protocol stimulation so i'm not going to tell you the protocols as i say for the ard this is the protocols what we have to use for the iui so you can start with the clomiphene citrate as already told from day 2 to day 6 plus we can add the hmg gonadotropin 75 international unit daily or alternate day from day 5 so we are using clomiphene also and we can reduce the dose of the gonadotropin also this is a soft protocol and the chances of hyperstimulation is also on the lower side and chances of getting pregnancy is also on the higher side with this protocol so cc with soft protocol gonadotropin it is chief as well as effective as i say so you cannot uh, do the more expenditure on the uh, iui cycles as i say the gonadotropins on day 3 why we are giving on day 3 so to recruit more than one follicles to dominant follicles so get a more number of follicles that's why we are giving the gonadotropins in the early follicular phase and the next is the gonadotropins in the late follicular phase so to counteract the anti estrogen effect of the cc that is there is increase in the estradiol level if you are using gonadotropin the late follicular stage enhance the preoperatory estradiol level for the effective ls search so a particular level of estradiol is essential for the ls search so what are the different protocols for the stimulation the conventional as i say you can use the cc or you can use the letrozole with or without adjuvant then the cc with the soft gonadotropin stimulation as i say so there are different protocols you can use the scattered protocol is there so you can use a cc along with the day 3 day 5 day 7 day 9 with clomiphene citrate as then the sequential after completion of the cc you give the cc till 6 day and then you can start with the you can give the alternate day you can give the gonadotropins and the fixed protocol so along with cc in the early follicular day 3 give one uh, uh, gonadotropins and on day 8 give the another dose of gonadotropins so these are the normal basic protocols what the gynecologist should use at their setup so those are the protocol protocols those are without risk of the ohs and all those things if there is no relation with the cc letrozole or the soft gonadotropin stimulation stimulation protocols so in that condition we can use a continuous low dose gonadotropin stimulation protocol so 
So what is the low dose gonadotropin stimulation protocol? I will tell. But some non-conventional protocols are also there. So we can use in a particular condition, particular group of patients. So as I say, CC with HMG with antagonist. So the same we can use the CC. Then we add the HMG. And when the dominant follicle is around 13, 14 mm, the, in that condition we can antagonist. So these are the main particular class of patient where there is premature LS surge. We can use this protocol for the good results. So what is the objective of low dose gonadotropins? As I say, to compensate the low level of FSH compared to the LH in the early follicular phase, like as in the PCOS patient. So you are not getting the uh, dominant follicle with the soft root stimulation protocol. So you have to go ahead with the low dose gonadotropins. to recruit additional codominant follicle in the early follicular phase and to avoid the anti-estrogenic effect of the promethen citrate so how to use this low dose gonadotropin protocol and why this is so this is to reduce the chances of complications so like the multiple uh, pregnancies like the chance of ohss so we can reduce and if you are the newcomer you are starting the gonadotropins you are handling the gonadotropins uh, recently so in that condition you can use this protocol and if other protocols of not of any useful then you can use this protocol the starting dose you can start with the 37.5 to 15 international unit you can give this medication the injection for 7 days if there is a dominant follicle more than 10 mm so you can continue with the same dose and when when the dominant follicle is around 18 20 you can give the uh, trigger if there is no dominant follicle more than 10 mm on after 7 days then in that condition you can step up the dose so from 37 you can increase to 75 and so on you can increase the dose until and unless you are getting a dominant follicle of 18 to 20 mm and the endometrium is more than 7 mm so this is a very basic low dose step up stimulation protocol for the iui you can use it for the iui so the other protocols are also there like step down protocol as i say this is a more physiological protocol so everybody knows about in the early follicular phase fsh is on the higher side and then fsh goes down the same thing we are doing in the step down protocols we are giving the higher dose 150 international unit in the early follicular phase once we have a dominant follicular 10 mm or more so then we step down the dose of gonadotropins and once we have a dominant follicular uh, around the 18 20 then we give the trigger but this the chances of with this protocol is the chances of hyper stimulation or the chances of ohss is on the higher side so normally we are not using this protocol for the iui and then the normal conventional regime as i say you can decide the dose of gonadotropin so that as early i say there are three a's are very important that is the age afc and amh so depends on these factors you can decide the dose and you can start the 75 to 150 international unit daily gonadotropins and you can give the sg trigger when the dominant follicle is around 18 so these are the different protocols what we are using for the iui as i say can we use jnrh antagonist in the iui so yes there are limited indications where we should use the antagonist to improve the result so if there is premature ls surge is associated with the lower pregnancy in iui so use of jnrh antagonist to restore the normal pregnancy rate in patient with the prior ls surge so we did one study in 2014 and 2015 this is an unpublished study actually so we took the patient who are having the premature ls surge in the previous cycles so we make a cohort of 30 patients and we use the antagonist for such kind of patients and we got a very good results can you see so almost 52% we got the result with this uh, things but the indications are very limited because the cost of treatment is on the higher side with this protocol so random controlled trial trial at our center so it's showing the pregnancy rate with antagonists around 35 to 40% with no antagonists around 80 to 22% so definitely this is a statistical difference in the pregnancy rate so we recommend to use of antagon in patient with the previous ls surge if the patient with utilized unruptured follicle and previous three failed iui cycles if it is there then you can use the antagonist before going ahead with the ivf so in a nutshell she uh, the summary of the ovulation is yes we should utilize the stimulation protocol cc is the first line of management then the low dose step up protocol can be used and grh antagonist and ls supplementation has a role in selected patients so these are the summary so we saw the selection of the patient so we work up the patient we individualize the management of the stimulation protocol that monitoring is very important of the stimulated cycles so as i say vision is an art of seeing invisible things so five reasons to monitor the stimulated cycle yes to evaluate the what the dose we have given is optimal or not 
to adjust the dose according to the response of the patient like the hyper responsive we have to reduce the dose if the poor responder we have to increase the dose to find the optimal timing to do the induction to time the IOI and to avoid the excess stimulation and that is to prevent the OHSS and the multiple pregnancy. So these are the reasons why we have to monitor the stimulation cycle. So how to monitor? So we can monitor with estradiol. We can do the ultrasound or either of both. We can use the power Doppler and other hormones to monitor the things. So monitoring, as I say, ultrasound state the morphological growth of the follicles and the hormones indicate the functional activity of the follicles. And the ultrasound is the main evaluation, line of evaluation for the stimulated cycles, even though for the IVF and for the IU also. So why transvaginal sonography? So this is the indication. These are the simple things we should know. It is very simple, easy. It is reproducible. It's reliable, cheap, can be done repeatedly. It's patient friendly also. And we can come to know the different things, antral follicles, over in volume, we can use a color Doppler or 3D, uh, 4D sonophys to evaluate the things. So transvaginal, simple, simple language, as they say, is a transvaginal probe is an extension of clinician's finger. So we have decided now, so we are going to do the transvaginal sonophy for the infertility management. So what is the importance of day two scan? As I said, it is very important. So to know the antral follicle count, it is very important for the decide the dose of the gonadotropins to rule out any cyst. If there is a cyst, should not do the ovulation induction. So give her OCPs and you can do it in the next cycle. See the endometrial shading. It is also very important. Sometimes patient come, they have only spotting. When we do the sonophy, the endometrial is around 8 mm, 10 mm, progest noise. So even though you stimulate the cycles, so definitely there is a growth of the uh, follicles. So follicle may rupture also, but the endometrium and follicular synchronization will not be there and there is a failure of the IUI in such condition and to rule out the other pathologies in the pelvis. So that is a very important day to scan. We have to do it. Then the serial monitoring, how we can do that. We can do the serial monitoring if you are using the oral agents. So you can start the monitoring from the day eight, nine also. But if you are using the gonadotropin, start the monitoring of the cycle from day six. So these are the newer modalities we have to use in our day-to-day -day practice. As I said, follicular Doppler study is very important. It tells us a lot of things. As a mature follicle shows a vascularity of at least three-fourths of the follicular circumference. When the PSV is 10 centimeters per second, at that time, LSS start. And this is the right time to give the STG trigger. So if we see all those factors, so we can, we can uh, do a trigger at proper time. We can give the trigger at proper time and there is an ovulation. Uh, it will be there. So interpretation of the ovarian indices is also another as I'm, now I'm going to talk on the, all the power Doppler. So rising PSV, fixed uh, systolic velocity and steady low RI if it is there. So this suggests the follicles close to the rupture. If there is a decrease in PSV and rising RI is there. So that su suggests that the, that follicle may become an lutenite unrupture follicles after the giving trigger. So we have to see these indices also. So perifollicular vascularization. So the grade, the maturity of the oocytes can be decided from this. There are a number of studies showing that if the vascularity on the higher side, the maturity of the follicles is also there. So grade one, if the perifollicular vascularization is less than 10%, is grade two, if 10 to 25%, then grade three, if 25 to 50%, and grade four, if the vascularity is more than 50%. So perifollicular vascularization is also very important. So in the Doppler study, so what are the predictors of the poor ovarian response? So we have to decide the dose of gonadotropins. As I say, if the ovarian volume is less than 3 cc, less than 3 antral follicles on either side, ovarian RI, is, if it is more than 0.6, ovarian PSV, if it is less than 5, and stomal flow index, if it is more than 11. So in such condition, if it is there, so we can say this is the poor responders and we have to start with the higher dose of gonadotropins in such cases. So as we see the follicles are very important, but along with the follicles, endometrium is also very important. The endometrial evaluation is equally important because there should be a synchronization of the follicle and endometrium to get a good results. So endocrine implantation, as I say, the best endometrium to at the time of SCG trigger is 8 mm to 14 mm is the best where we'll get a good results. If the endometrium is on the higher side, more than 16 or it is less than seven. So it is not associated with good prognosis. So this is, now we are going to see the power Doppler evaluation of the endometrium. As I say, only thickness is not the criteria. 
So along with the thickness, we should know the morphology. How is the morphology of the endometrium and how is the blood perfusion of the endometrium? So up to which zone perfusion is there, we should look after that part also. If the perfusion is on the upper zone, so that will give us a good result. So this is a studies that have shown the endometrial evaluation with the conception rates according to zone of asperity. If the, the perfusion is up to zone one, so the conception rate is only 5.2%. But you are seeing when the perfusion is up to zone 4, the pregnancy rate is up to 74%. So there is a huge difference. So not only, is, as I say, not only the thickness, morphology, but the blood perfusion is equally important as an endometrial evaluating factor. The next one is the uterine artery doppler. As I say, this also plays a very important role. The chance of pregnancy is almost zero when the ara is more than three so this is a we have to do while at the time of trigger we have to look after the, these factors also then 3d power doppler for endometrial receptivity as i say previously we are saying the endometrial thickness but with the 3d 4d machine we can evaluate the endometrium volume is very important if volume is more than 1.9 ml gives a good result but if there is a volume is less than 1 ml so that suggests the number of abnormalities in the uterus, like Asherman syndrome, or the septate uterus, or the arcuate uterus, so or T-shaped uterus. If volume is less than one ml, so in that condition, the chances of pregnancy is very low. And with the 3D, we can see the global vascular day of the endometrium also, as we can see in this figure. So now to conclude with the monitoring. So as I say, is monitoring is very important in the hand of experienced operator. Ultrasound and ultrasound alone is sufficient to do the cycle monitoring. There is no need of any biochemical test to do while monitoring the, these things. And ultrasound should be done by the gynecologist and not by the radiologist. The first step, you should know a proper ultrasound. And if you are good in ultrasound, so definitely you can increase your results of the IUI as well as the IVF. So next important step is the ovulation trigger. When to give the trigger, it is also very important. So it is the most crucial step and is the last step of the ovarian uh, ovulation induction protocol. So if you are using the clomiphene or letrazole, so these are the practical points I'm going to tell you. So if clomiphene or letrazole, so you give the trigger a little bit late when the follicle is around 20, 22, definitely you get a good result. So if you are using the gonadotropins, so you can give a little bit early uh, trigger that is around 18, 20, you can give the trigger. This is the ideal when we have to give the trigger, but it is not the same at every time. As I say, if there is a problem in the endometrium, endometrial uh, thickness is not good. In that condition, you have to delay the trigger. You have to increase the endometrial thickness first and then give the trigger. This is also a very important step. So what are the agents to do the ovulation trigger? So there are a number of, of agents as we are using the gonadotropin SCG. The dose is around 5,000 to 10,000 international unit intramuscular. We can use a recombinant SCG. So that is around 250 micrograms subcutaneously we can give or in case if you are using the antagonist cycle, we can give GnRH agonist trigger 1 milligram per ml subcutaneously or sometimes if you are giving the only this uh, without antagonist, but if you are using the gonadotropins in that condition and she's having the uh, hyperstimulated patient in that condition, you can use the GnRH agonist as a trigger. So how to confirm the ovulation by the sonophy? I'm seeing sonophy is very important. Disappearance of the follicles, what you're seeing in the early sonophy, the follicles disappear, then presence of free fluid in the POD, again, suggests the ovulation. And you can see the presence of hyperechoic smooth secretory endometrium. That means the progesterone release is there. And because of progesterone effect, the endometrium becomes a secretory endometrium. But this third one is they will be there after 24 hour of rupture of the follicle. So you can, if the triple line trilaminar endometrium is there, you can say the rupture is within 24 hours. If it is a progesterone endometrium, you can say rupture is before 24 hours is there. So this is about the trigger. Then when to do the IUI. So timing of IUI is another concern by the number of people. So these are the questions are frequently asked. So whether to do the before ovulation, whether to do the after ovulation, how many times we have to do the IUI with a single IUI is sufficient or the double IUI is sufficient. So definitely there are some indication if there is a male factor in fertility, then definitely double IUI gives a very good results. If there is no male factor in fertility, you can go ahead with a single IUI. When we are seeing the Cochrane's database, in 2010, they came with the conclusion that the single IUI is more than sufficient. There is no uh, benefit with the double IUI. But again, in 2015, they come with a different thought that is double IUI gives a good result than the single IUI. 
So if you are doing the double IUI, if you are doing the single IUI, when to do the IUI, single IUI, 36 to 40 hours after the SCG trigger. And if you want to do the double IUI in that condition, first IUI should be done pre, that is pre ovulatory IUI should be done 24 to 28 hours. And the second IUI to be done in 36 to 40 hours. First confirm the rupture and then do the second IUI. So this is about the trigger. The next is a sperm preparation technique. As I say, these are all the links with each other. So there should not be a single technique for the all. As I say, first screen the sample and then decide which technique we have to use for the sperm processing. So selection of optimal technique is very important. As I said, a number of techniques are there for the sperm uh, processing. So these are the some modifications of routine procedures in different seminopathy. So if there is an asthenozoospermia, so can you use the split ejaculate. You can do the pentoxyphaline co-culture, sample collection in media. If there is oligosuspermia, you can do the full sequential samples to get a more volume and more sperm available for the process. Then if there is a defective liquefaction, the viscous sample is there. So in that condition, sample collection in media, pallet and swim up techniques, if there is retrograde ejaculation, so we can harvest the sperm from the postcoital masturbation urine. But before that, we have to look that the, we have to alkalize the urine first and then we can recover the spermatozoa from the urine. And if there is anti-sperm antibodies, we can collect the sample with the, in the media containing 50% serum and we can do the density gradient technique. So these are very important. So this semenopathy we are depends on the other uh, to do the uh, semen processing. So if they are not followed the proper protocols, so again, it gives a uh, decreases the result of the IUI. So this is about the processing of the sample. Then we are coming to the IUI procedures. So this is what exactly it is and what precaution we need to take while doing the IUI. As I say, IUI should be done in the clinic where the process, of the sample, where the sample is processing done. So there is no need of any medication or any analgesic during the procedure. Speculum is placed into the vagina and cervical area clean with the normal saline. And the specimen of highly motile sperm is placed into the uterine cavity using a special flexible catheter. So don't use the rigid catheters. The flexible catheter can negotiate the OS very well. So these are the standard techniques. So what we are using or we should use to improve the result because the gynecologists are doing the IUI. So ask the patient to fool the bladder if she's having the antiverted uterus. If retroverted uterus, there is no need to fool the bladder. So give her lithotomy position, cervix is exposed with the bywall speculum, clean the cervix with the normal saline. At that time, you have to load the sample. It is very important and load the sample without bubbles and 0.5 ml sample is sufficient. And then you have to inject that sample into the uterus. So you insert the catheter tip and should not touch the catheter tip to the fundus. As soon as the, this catheter tip touches the fundus, so there is release of prostaglandin. And because of release of prostaglandin, there is a corneal spasm and there is reflux of the, and the cramp contraction also, and there, is, there will be a reflux of the semen sample. So you have to inseminate that sample into the mid cavity or just above the mid cavity. That is very important. So for doing this, you should see the uh, UCL and accordingly that much of in depth, you can inseminate the IUI sample. So if there is a difficulty in encountering the insertion of the catheters, so number of times we are unable to negotiate the OS. So negotiating OS is a, as I say, it is not a science, it is an art. So it's very important as even not in the IUI, but even though in the IVF cycles, when we are doing the embryo transfer, the most important step in the IUS IVF success also is the embryo transfer and to negotiate the OS is very important. So use the flexible catheters if you cannot able to negotiate the OS. So see the direction of the cervix, whether it's antiverted, whether it's retroverted, whether it's deviated to uh, right side or whether it is deviated to the left side. So you have to see that first and accordingly you have to insert the catheters. So if there is still problem in inserting the catheter, you can use the rigid catheter or you can use the abdominal sonophy to see the cervical canal. And as I say, avoid use of tenaculum because as soon as you use the tenaculum, there is a decrease in the chances of the success. So inject the sperm, leave the catheter in place for a short time. So immediately should not take out the catheter, keep it there for some times and slowly take it out and tell the patient to be to less uh, rest for in supine position for 10 minutes or so. Then after that, she can do all kind of work. There is no need to take any kind of bed rest. So what the precaution we should take while doing the IUI, as I say, aseptic techniques to avoid infection. So, but should not use the iodine because it is a spermicidal. 
and antibiotic prophylaxis is not necessary. You have to just the clean the cervix with the normal saline and you can do the IUI. The IUI room should be a clean room. That is very important. And gentle technique to avoid trauma to the endometrium. As I said, as soon as if you uh, catch the cervix or you, uh, it is difficult to, to negotiate the os, so it will create a cramp because of result of the prostaglandin and there might be a bleeding. So in that condition, you can have a lesser sperm survival and there is a decreased chances of the IUI. So what are the technical points we have to consider while doing IUI? Which catheters? Number of times uh, we have a question, which catheters, whether you use the soft catheter, which is catheter. As I say, flexible catheter is very important. Flexible catheter you can use. If there is problem in the flexible catheter, you can go ahead with the rigid catheters. So brand doesn't matter unless and until it is a uh, ETO sterilized or it is an MVA tested catheter, absolutely fine. Location of the tip of the catheter, as I say, should not touch the fundus. It should be just below the fundus or just above the mid cavity, you can do the insemination. And bed rest after IUI, absolutely there is no bed rest needed after IUI. She can do all the routine work as she is doing before IUI. And the last important thing is the luteal support. As I say, it is also very important. So to all the patient, we should give the luteal support or to particular class of patient, we should give luteal support. If you want to give the luteal support, which kind of support should be given for the IUI patient? So there are agents, what we can use for luteal support is the progesterone, estrogen and SCG also we can give. So in the progesterone, there are a number of progesterone, oral progesterone, sustained release is also there, intravaginal progesterone, naturally mechanized progesterone, gels are available, parenteral progesterone is there and the progesterones are there. So you can use any kind of progesterone which is comfortable to the patient, it's very important. And if there is, if you are using the promethine citrate, the endometrium is not good in that condition, you can add the estrogen also. And SCG when to add, if the cycles are short, she having the premenstrual uh, spotting and uh, in that condition, you can add the SCG once in a week also. So vaginal progesterone after ovulation induction in IUI, use a higher live birth rate with compared to the no progesterone support. This definitely, you have to give a support of the progesterone is very important. And if required, you can add the estradiol also. If required, you can add the SCG also. So more benefit of the luteal phase support is in the gonadotropin stimulated cycles, history of unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. In this condition, you add luteal support is very important. And if luteal phase is less than 10 days, that is a short luteal phase, short cycle. So you have to add the luteal phase support in those patients. So when we are seeing the result, so results when we are doing the only IUI, the pregnancy rate is around 18%, but super ovulation with IUI using the antagonist cycle, the results are quite promising. So we can go up to 33% also in a particular class of patient. So coming to the IUI results are very important. So if you are doing the only control over in hyperstimulation, the result is around 6.3%. But if you're only doing IUI without stimulation, the result is only 3.4%. But when you are doing the combination of control over and hyperstimulation with IUI, then the results are quite promising around 19.6%. So this is, the, this is something of optimizing the result. This is the highest result. We cannot say that the, it is around 20, 30% results in the IUI. So best result in, in the IUI is around 18 to 20% is there. So you have to explain this to the patient also very well. So what are the reasons for the failure of the IUI? As I say, so we have seen all the chains where we can have the problems and that leads to the failure of the IUI. So poor responders as the selection is not a proper, so selection of protocol is not proper. So poor responders, there is a failure. If there is a hyper responder, as I say, selection is not proper and we use another protocols. And if she is underwent to the OHSS, then again, we have to cancel the cycles that leads to again a failure. Luteinized unruptured follicles, as I say, it is very important in basically in the polycystic ovary patients. So if there is a high level of LH, so we'll have to control that before uh, starting with the IUI, give one to two cycles of the oral contraceptive pills, and then you can go ahead with the IUI, or you can do the laparoscopy with the PCO rolling. So whenever you are doing the PCO rolling, you have to follow the rule of four, which is very important. And the timing of trigger is very important. As I say, color Doppler studies is very important to give a proper timing. So that is another problem where the IUI failure happens, the endometrium problem. So everybody's talking about the follicles, but nobody's talking about the endometrium. So endometrium is very important. So look after the synchronization of the 
endometrium and follicle is very important to get a good results and the last is unsatisfactory semen parameters the sample is not processed properly according to semenopathy so that gives a failure of the iui so number of iui cycle as i say so pregnancy rate are significantly lower after the third iui cycle so how many cycles we have to do so irrespective of ovulation in this method so these are the newer guidelines has been given by the asrm in 2019 previously we are saying so around five to six cycles are sufficient for the iui but now we are saying the three to four cycles are sufficient if there is no properly done iui cycle if there is no pregnancy you have to move ahead with the ivf because the result of ivf are very promising nowadays because of the high end technologies that is the main thing so at that point we have to move on the more aggressive treatment and three to Three, three to six cycles of IUI depends on the cause of infertility. You can try, but ideally three to four cycles are sufficient. So, so this is all about how we can optimize the results. So these are the few secrets while doing IUI. We have to see these secrets where we can improve those. So first secret is the right choice based on the facts, that is etiology. So we are getting the good result. In case of unexplained infertility, cervical factor infertility, unauditory infertility, or the donor IUI. And the result of IUI will be on the lower side if there is severe male factor infertility, pubal factors, or the pelvic adhesions, or the severe endometriosis. So, result of IUI is going to be on the lower side. The second secret of IUI results is understand the case. That's very important. So, good responders, that is a young uh, lady with a good crop of periovulatory follicles, a good endometrium. And next is the poor responders like the older uh, lady. The duration of infertility is more than five years. If the poor ovarian reserve is there, the poor endometrium thickness is there, and the sperm quality is also poor. So in such condition, got a poor response. So the uh, result is on the lower side. The third secret is implantation of ovarian stimulation protocol. As I say, should not use the same protocol for all. So you have to decide the protocols according to the patients. So use the gonadotropins if required use the antagonist in the iui gives a very promising result as i said the fourth secret is a poor endometrium thickness so many times as i said cc is having the peripheral anti-estrogenic effect so it is having the negative effect on the endometrial thickness as well as endometrial vascularity so in such condition you have to add the estradiol valerate delay the trigger or use the gonadotropin in the next cycles if till it is on the lower side you can do the hysteroscopy lateral metroplasty you can do the scratching of the endometrium and if there is a vascularity on the lower side, you can increase the vascularity by the number of medications are there. You can use those medications and you can improve the vascularity of the endometrium. The fifth secret is follicular monitoring is very important. As I say, do it by yourself is very important. So as already we covered, so follicular monitoring is very important to monitor the cycle and also to give the right SG trigger at the right time. So do the right things at the right time is very important. The trigger when the, if you're using gonadotropins, give it around when the follicle is around 18 mm. And if you're using the promethine citrate, you can delay the trigger when the follicle is around 20 to 22 mm. Perifollicular perfusion should be around 50 to 70%. RI should be on the lower side less than 0.5 and PSV should be more than 11. If these factors are there at that, this is the right time to give the triggers. So you can give the SCG trigger or if there's a chances of your OHSS, so you can use the agonist trigger also. Then the, as I said, timing of IUI is 36 to 40 hours when you are doing the single IUI. And if you are doing the double IUI, single IUI basically for the no male factors. If there is no male problems, you can do the single IUI also post structure IUI. If double IUI, the male factor is there or if sometimes the PSP is more than 20, that means the follicle already there is a LS surge is there and follicle going to rupture before 36 hours in such condition if there is a high psv so in that condition you can plan the iui first iui in 24 to 24 to 28 hours and the second maybe at 36 to 40 hours so do the right thing at right time is very important and the next secret is the lab secret as i said there should be a proper abstinence at the time of iui selection cement collection should be done in a proper way cement preparation as i say there are different seminopathy for different seminopathy. We have to use a different method of the processing the sample and high quality of consumables and media is also very important and preparation should be done in the clinic and should not send the patient outside and ask the sample from that uh, lab. So it is very important. Uh, these are the secrets. Then the next is uh, success lies in looking into detailed technique. As I say, the full bladder should be there, cervical mucus aspiration, 
so many times there are two school of thoughts so some are saying we have to aspirate the mucus one according to me there is no need to aspirate the mucus we have to just clean the cervix and you can do the iui target timing of iui from the collection of the sample to the insemination of the sample should not be more than 90 minutes load the sample when everything is ready the patient is ready the position has been given the cervix is clean now load the sample without bubble no free space should be kept into the uh, after during loading the sample and you do the iui and tell her to take a rest for 10 minutes that is more than sufficient easy iui without uh, proper negotiation is there so that gives a good results again so then next secret is the luteal support as i said progesterone vaginal progesterone is showing the increased pregnancy rate by the number of studies they are showing we have to use the vaginal progesterone having the good absorption also and 10 secret is as i say counseling is very important knowing when to stop so you have to explain the patient yes this is the result of the iui we tried the iui in a proper way we use all the type of things we uh, do the all the uh, investigations we use the all way different protocols but still unable to conceive if it is there or there is some other factors so consult the patient and as i say previous the we are saying five to six iui but now we are saying three to four properly done iui are sufficient if you did that one you have to consult the patient you have to tell the result of the iui and you have to tell the patient so now we have to stop and we have to move ahead with the next management so we should know when to stop and what next is assisted reproduction is the art facilities where we can offer that patient a good modalities of management as i say so the advanced technology in the ivf setup is also very important and the exclusive ivf setups are uh, there are number of now uh, our center is there at uh, Thane, so it is also exclusive IV center with all kind of gadgets and newer modalities are there at Progenesis Fertility Center also. So we have to tell the patient after that you have to take an advanced technologies are there, so you have to move ahead with the IV pixie, MC pixie and the other things. So where you will get a good result. So these are the things we have to say to the patient and these are the things we have to do in a proper way to optimize the result of the IUI. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for, for such an exhaustive purview on IUI. There are many questions which I... Uh, yeah, madam. Sir, first question is timing of IUI for a single attempt IUI. As you... Uh, as I have already mentioned uh, in my presentation, madam, if you are doing the single IUI, so you have to see the, uh, I don't know, many gynecologists are not doing the color Doppler, but it's very much important on the PSV value. If you, your PSV is more than 20, as I say, you should do the single IUI is sufficient, but you have to do that IUI early, that is between 24 to 28 hours. But if you are giving the trigger at the right time, then single IUI, if you want to do, it should be done after 36 to 40 hours of the SCG trigger or the GNRH agonist trigger. So depends on the these things. As I say, you can do the IUI. Depends on the uh, PSV value. Second thing, if there is a male factor infertility, so if it is there, then in that condition, the best result will be there with the double IUI, and that should be done 24 to 28 hours and 36 to 40 hours after the SCG trigger. So number of attempts before converting the patient to for from IUI to IVF. Since you have already mentioned that first, initially two, three cycles, we should try with CC, Important. then try with CC plus gonadotrophins. So that only makes the cycle three plus three plus three. So uh, now limiting the IUI cycles to three to four is a contradiction of the two. Uh, um, I, I, I know, madam. So uh, let me answer on this. It's a very good question because there are a number of uh, school thoughts are there and Previously, we are saying five to six IUI as, uh, should be done. But the, my words are very clear. Properly done IUI is very important word. What I have used in my presentation, because we are seeing number of times the IUI is done in a non IUI setups also. So those we should not consider those as a IUI. So if when there is a proper stimulation protocol the, that in under one roof everything has been done, 
a proper selection of the patient is there all the investigation has been done so number of times we are seeing the patient they are coming to us and they had a number of iuis but the tubal patency test is not done or there is a male factor infertility as i use very clear uh, this thing the total motile sperm fraction is very important for doing the iui so that if it is more than 5 million so that is an indication of iui so you should select the patient properly if all indications are proper and all investigations are done a proper stimulation protocol has been used at the proper setup so that what we are saying the 5 to 6 iui what we are doing right now but as i say i have to tell the what are the new things coming into the uh, uh, this thing ivf so so as asrm guidelines are there in 2019 only they are saying 3 to 4 ius iui are more than sufficient but the important thing is 3 to 4 iui properly at properly done with the proper indication and properly done at a proper center so which is very important if it is there then definitely we can move ahead with the ivf and not with the only so sometimes we are saying the periphery at periphery we are saying the so husband is going somewhere else giving the samples the lab is processing the samples they are coming with the that samples so so in that condition we cannot rely on that samples so even though we are doing the good thing at our place so we cannot we are dependent on the other for the results so as the word is very important properly done iui cycles 3 to 4 hours sufficient but till we are doing at present 5 to 6 we are doing but over the period of time so we have to reduce the uh, because the results are very promising in first 3 to 4 cycles and after that the results are gone down drastically so that's why when we are seeing the results of iui are not that promising but when we are seeing the result of ivf the result of ivf are very promising nowadays so the technology is so advanced so even though there are number of problems are there we can treat the patient and we we are getting a very good result in the ivf so that's why they have reduced the cycle from 5 to 6 because the financial burden what the patient is having with the extra iui cycle so that can be reduced and that can be used for the ivf so that's why those are the uh, guidelines but yes we can use the 5 to 6 iui properly done iui for the good results the next question is from dr rajneesh patel that uh, in the last webinar uh, i think it was told to us by dr jaydeep town that we should ignore the cyst uh, as they are supposed to be non functional so is it so or, or should we always uh, uh, cancel the iui cycle if we observe the cyst right uh, absolutely is a very good question madam so as i uh, mentioned it's very properly if the cyst is more than 3 cm so definitely we should cancel the cycle so there are two kinds of things one is a functional cyst as i say if there is a functional cyst and at that time we can do the estradiol level if the estradiol level is more than 50 so in that condition we have to cancel the cycles because while doing these things so if there is even the functional cyst we are stimulating the uh, ovary but when the e2 is on the higher side so again as i say there is a negative feedback effect of the high estradiol level and there is a decrease in the pulse and amplitude of the gnrh release so fsh is on the lower side so even though you are doing the cycle so it will give a poor result and second the effect of the cyst is there on the endometrium so we have to look after the endometrium if there is a chronic cyst chronic simple cyst so we can ignore that cyst but if it is a as is is a follicular cyst so we have to wait for a month and it is very important to uh, do justice with the patient that is very important so we should not be on the always on the toe to start with the cycles yes proper indications proper work up is very important so according to me there might be as i said there might be a, a difference in the thought process difference in the as i said there are a number of schools of the thoughts so according to me do the justice with the patients so wait for a month that doesn't matter to a patient also instead of doing a a uh, 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 improper cycle so starting point is very important so according to me you should wait if there is a cyst more than 3 cm uh, if you want to go in details that you can do the estradiol level if it's on the high side so definitely you have to wait and you have to go ahead in the next cycle if it is a chronic cyst as i say chronic cyst and the estradiol level is on the lower side then in that condition you can start with the stimulation again in that say i, I, I would like to say add the things that you can do the laparoscopy you have to rule out the things you have to take out the uh, you have to puncture the cyst even, even though it is a chronic cyst and then you can go ahead with the uh, iui in the next cycle so there is uh, next question is from dr kishore sometimes the follicle doesn't grow beyond 13 or 14 mm and then it regresses what should be done 
so uh, it is a very uh, good question as i i, I, I said in my slides the ovulation uh, physiology is very important so when there is a is a late follicular phase so in the late follicular phase lh is on the low higher side and the fs is on the lower side and there is a as we are saying the lh receptors are there so in such condition if you are encountering such problems so in that condition two things are very important should not use the only recombinant lh uh, recombinant fsh you have to add the recombinant lh into the stimulation protocol that is very important that is the first thing second thing you have you can use the gnrh agonist protocol so what i have only i have not mentioned it so you can downgrade the cycle and then you can stimulate the cycle with the gonadotropin so you get a good results and third thing instead of using uh, recombinant fsh we can use the normal urinary gonadotropin at the right time so because when the estradiol lh receptors on the higher side then and then there is release of higher estradiol level and when the particular level of estrogen is there then and then there will be ls surge so if such patients so there is a stagnancy in the growth of the follicles you can add lh that gives a very good result sir if uh, um, in a cycle we give a uh, trigger at uh, 38 to 40 hours and later on we find that the uh, the follicle has not ruptured should we give a repeat trigger and how many times it should be repeated if the follicle fails to rupture then what to do uh absolutely madam uh, we can give a repeat trigger if you are, you gave the trigger and after 36 40 hours you did the sonography and there is a unruptured follicles so as i said there are two kind of things if your trigger is not proper then also there will be a problem in the ovulation and second if there is a premature ls surge is already there in that condition also there will be a luteinized unruptured follicle but yes you can attempt by giving the second trigger you can give at that time and you have to wait again for 48 hours and you can change the trigger also as i say if you are using the agonist cycles the now that is in the ivf there is a concept of dual trigger so we are giving the dual trigger that is one trigger with the uh, 99% we are doing the antagonist cycles so we are giving the dual trigger that is scg trigger as well as we are giving the agonist trigger so in that condition if you are giving you are using the antagonist cycle you can give the agonist trigger in such condition and if you are using the normal cycle you can give the if you are given the normal urinary ha scg you can give the recombinant scg and again you have to wait for uh, 36 to 40 hours so you see the things if there is a rupture you can do the iui if there is no rupture then you have to cancel the cycles and as i said that is luteinized after run rupture follicles you have to work up the first and then again you have to start with the proper stimulation sir in covid times how soon can we start doing the iui Uh, Should we test the patient for COVID all the time? There, are, there, there are the guidelines of Madam ASRM guidelines. Are there extra guidelines? Are there? So now uh, the number of centers they are started with the OPD, but not uh, really. We are not started with the IUI, IVF, or the embryo transfer right now because we don't know the effect of the COVID on the early trimester pregnancy. There are number of uh, cases are there. They have delivered in the late trimester. and uh, there is no infection showing to the uh, kids but in the early trimester it is a viral infection we don't know about that part so that all depends on the but the now the guidelines what they are said you have to consult the patient if patient patient is ready you have to take a consent form of the patient yes we have been explained the all risk of the covid during my treatment and if i conceived also to the baby has been explained by the clinic to us and the, till the patient wants the treatment then definitely you can offer the treatment to the patient but you have to work up the patient as i say you have to do the covid 19 test before uh, starting the stimulation and before the iui also you have to sir uh, this is also a repeat question from dr rajin why full bladder during iui uh, it is as i say if there is a acutely antiverted uterus is there so so the angle of the cervical canal is acute so in that condition we can heat the catheter at the cervix at the posterior wall of the cervix when we do the full bladder so with the full bladder the there is a straightening of the canal and when there is a straightening of the canal we can negotiate the os very easily so that's why if there is a acutely antiverted uterus or antiverted uterus partially full bladder or full uh, if uh, full bladder to be should should be there for the negotiation of that will create the straightening of the cervical canal and it there will be a easy we can do the easy iui but that should not be there with the retroverted uterus if the retroverted uterus so we should not tell the patient to evacuate the bladder and then we have to do the iui 
नुपुर मैडम नुपुर मैडम डॉक्टर आशुतोष आजगावकर हैज रेज द हैंड तो शुड आई अनम्यूट हिम यस 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 प्लीज ओके आई हैव सेंट अ मैसेज हां सर आशुतोष सर या 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 नो द द क्वेश्चन इज दैट द स्पर्म्स हैव बीन फाउंड टू हैव हेलो हेलो गो ऑन गो ऑन Yes. Yeah, yeah. The sperms have been found to contain the virus. No, that was a paper presented. So, uh, you think there is a uh, after processing, uh, it can still be transmitted or any data? Do we have anything like that? Uh, sir, now uh, maybe one present, uh, one or two papers are there, but number of papers are showing nowadays. So there are number of studies also done in the basically by the ASRM uh, group. so they are saying there is no virus in the sperm as well as there is no virus in the follicular fluid so they have mentioned very clearly so unless and until the patient even though there is a covid 19 infection it is not transmitted to the sperm so that is a very important so there are number of studies maybe you are talking about one or two study but there are number of studies those are there with the asrm and maybe uh, the asia also few studies they are come with the in asia also uh, so they are saying the the virus is not we are not found the virus into the semen sample and as well as the papers are there in the follicular fluid also they aren't able to get the virus so definitely not uh, a very clear cut idea is there maybe one or two papers are also like this they are getting the virus but we don't know about that part so that's why i said it's very important to tell the patient to consult the patient and if the patient is ready to take a consent form and then you can do the iui so our main role is to consult the patient tell the all the ifs and buts about the covid and then till she wants the iui then we can go ahead with the iui sir what antagonist in your experience is good from dr rajendra madam all the antagonists are same you can use the cetrorelix you can use the ganrelix so those are the two molecules of antagonists are there but there are number of preparations in the market so you can use any uh, antagonist in the dose of 0.25 mg subcutaneously daily so that has to be started when the there are two types of protocol for using the antagonist so one is a fixed protocol and second is a uh, variable protocol so flexible protocol so normally for the iui we have to use the flexible protocol that is we have to start with the antagonist when the leading follicle is around 13 to 14 mm at that time we have to add the antagonist and we can do give the daily hmg or daily uh, gonadotropins and when dominant follicles are 18 20 we can give the agonist trigger as well as we can give the hcg trigger in separate arms at at the same time or at different timings on the same day and what we have the antagonist and the gonadotropin have to be given they can be given at the same time when the yes, patient yes, 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 madam absolutely at the same location. time and at the same time you can inject the if your subcutaneous also there you can inject at the two different places but you should not mix the injection the two different injection can be given at the same time that is not a problem for uh, for unexpected high follicular response what should we do sir uh so as i say uh, the first important thing is a prevention so we have to select the patient properly if the patient is having the polycystic ovary if the patient is uh, having the high amh values So in that condition, we have to use a, as I say, chronic low dose type of protocol is very important. And if you are using that protocol, the chances of hyperstimulation is on the lower side. And as I say, you have to when you are using the gonadotropins, you have to start the monitoring the cycles early on the day six or day seven only. So by that time, we'll come to know the response. If there is hyperstimulation, so we can reduce the dose. That is the first thing. If we are seeing the more number of follicles, we can cancel the cycle. And if you are you did the sonography later, so that is maybe around ten, day ten or eleven. We are if, when you are seeing the number of follicles they have grown up. So in that condition, there there are two strategies are very important. First, you have to consult the patient. Yes, now the ovary is already been hyperstimulated, so we can convert that into the IVF cycle. That is the, something called as the minimum ovarian stimulation protocol. So we can convert into the IVF cycle, and definitely uh, there will not be a problem in the IVF, even though we are having the number of follicles. and the second we have to explain the patient if patient is not ready for the ivf you have to explain the patient the problems what she might encounter in the uh, uh, in the next this thing so in that condition the second thing if there are 8 to 10 follicles we can give the use the antagonist and we can give the agonist trigger so there will be a very less chance of ohss 
while using the agonist trigger and third if there are if there is a number of follicles and not ready for the iv also in that condition just give the antagonist and don't give the any uh, this thing hmg or the any trigger so the follicles will regress automatically so there will be a no chance of ohss in that condition so depends on the patient counseling is very important patient response we can decide the next uh, line of management sir in uh, uh, for the gynecologist who have the ultrasound machine but they don't have the very high end power, uh, doppler uh, system uh, will it be prudent to first prove that uh, to get the evidence that the ovulation has taken place and then do iui especially for those who are practicing single iui madam it is it is very important always always if you are doing the post after iui so you have to confirm the first ovulation is very important so sometimes we are doing the iui without sonography and there might be a luteinized and ruptured follicles so there might be a follicles may rupture uh, early so in that condition the we have to confirm the iui as my slides i have shown to you the circulation of the follicles free fluid in the pod and then the secretory endometrium these are the very important markers by the sonography we can pick it up and when we confirm the rupture of the follicle then and then do the iui if there is follicle is not ruptured then as i say you have to wait you have to do the sonography again after 3 to 4 hours till it is not ruptured you can give the second trigger also okay. you can call the patient after maybe after 24 to 36 and do the sonography if the rupture is there then and then you do the iui if there is no rupture there is no point in doing iui sir what is the minimum number of sperm count in the uh, wash semen that we should that is good for the iui ideally ideally if you ask me madam a normal uh, pre wash and post wash uh, is so pre wash at least we should have more than 15 million but the only the count is not important motility is also very important so so motility should be more than 32% and in the post wash normally what we are doing is a total motile sperm fraction we are seeing so so in the total motile sperm fraction we see the motility we see the count then we multiply it with the volume and multiply with the percentage of motility that gives us the total motile sperm fraction if the total motile sperm fraction is more than 5 million then we can do the iui so iui gives a good result so that is an cut off line for the iui more than 5 million so another question from dr sunita more in uniconvert uterus with failed iuis can i shift her for ivf okay uh so uh, what what is the uh, maybe so what is the indication should i repeat the should i repeat the question i i In... got i got your question madam but uh, there is no complete question that's why uh, so uniconet even though there is a uniconet uterus or the uh, there is a normal uterus if there is a failed uh, iui definitely ivf is an indication but many times we are saying in the uniconet uterus the endometrium thickness is not that great so before going ahead with the iui before ivf so we have to do the histoscopy in that with the lateral and fundal metroplasty we have to see the volume of the uh, that horn is also very important if the volume is good do the uh, volume is good just see the do the histoscopy and you can come out if the, there is the volume is on the lower side you can do the lateral metroplasty fundal metroplasty and then proceed for the ivf or even if everything is normal the tubes and the volume you did the lateral metroplasty you can do or one or two more iui and then if not conceive then you can move to ivf so definitely uniconet uterus is definitely even though it's a normal uterus or uniconet uterus iui failure properly done iui failures are there you have to move ahead with the ivf but the particular precaution in uniconet uterus sir, they are having the thin endometrium many times so do the fundal lateral metroplasty and then go ahead with the ivf the unilateral uh, tubal blockage should we attempt iui आसिफला फोन कर चेची लग गयो नीचे ऑफ कोर्स ऑफ कोर्स मैडम एक्चुअली एज आई से इवन दो इफ द बोथ ट्यूब्स आर ओपन और द सिंगल ट्यूब आल्सो ओपन सो वी कैन डू द आईयूआई प्रोवाइडेड द ओवुलेशन इज ऑन द सेम साइड व्हिच इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सो इफ देयर इज अ राइट ट्यूबल ब्लॉक एंड इफ देयर इज अ डोमिनेंट फॉलिकल ऑन द राइट साइड एंड द राइट फॉलिकल इज रप्चर सो डोंट डू द आईयूआई यू विल नॉट गेट द रिजल्ट सो द सेम साइड ओवुलेशन इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इफ द सेम साइड ओवुलेशन इज देयर देन यू कैन डू द आईयूआई देयर इज नो प्रॉब्लम the what dose of vaginal progesterone for luteal support and dose of estradiol valerate would you uh, recommend dr so kishor no, normally that all depends on the first thing is all depends on the indication if you are using the clomiphen citrate and the endometrium thickness is not good then starting dose of estradiol valerate it should be around 2 mg 
TDS. That is a six milligram you can give. So that is a normal dose where you can improve the endometrium very nicely. And second about the progesterone. If you are talking about the progesterone, so progesterone normally for the IUI, if you want to give the vaginal dose, so that is according to what the normal papers are saying, the 200 milligram. uh twice a day that is 400 mg is sufficient so for the uh, if you are using the vaginal uh, progesterone or you can use a gel 0.8% gel sing one times in a day that is also useful so either 400 mg or a 0.8% of vaginal gel is more than sufficient to give a progesterone support for the post rupture uh, for the iui patients basically So from Dr. Rajendra, is it necessary to evaluate before starting metformin like uh, serum insulin uh, or ovulation induction? So basically, uh, the polycystic ovary. We should understand the physiology of the polycystic ovary. So even though if you are doing the fasting serum insulin, so what the different things you can do? So I believe personally, I believe personally, believe on the very minimum investigation. so you have to see the clinical things before starting with the things if there is a hyperandrogenism is very important if there is hyperandrogenism in the clinical you can see the acne then you can uh, see the uh, oily skin the obesity hirsutism if those signs symptoms are there so in that condition definitely there is no need of doing the fasting serum insulin directly you can start with the metformin that is 800 mg twice a day is, uh, is sufficient for that patient and tell her first to reduce the weight when there is a reduction in the weight so there is a decrease in the androgen levels also we can do the dihydroquinolone sulfate level also in that condition but not routinely should be done in all patients so clinical acumen is very important see the clinical findings see the signs so that is a clinical things what the clinician can do so all things should not be done on the report so you have to judge the things and yes if required definitely we can do the patients insisting nowadays patients are so smart they are coming to us with the number of literature number, number of papers they are they are taking with them so in that condition we have to do, do the levels and then we have to go ahead with the metformin therapy there are no more questions hello sir the role of ultrasound to guide the catheter pardon sir role of ultrasound mm -hmm. to guide the catheter yes uh, i got that question into my chat box also so ultrasound as i say when there is a difficult uh, difficulty in negotiating the os so in that condition you can put the probe upper abdomen keep the bladder full put the probe and you can see the canal so accordingly you can negotiate that catheter so in that condition you have to use a soft catheter as i say so we can see the canal with the per abdomen also we have we know the direction of the and we can insert it very easily so sometimes even though with the per abdominal it is not possible then we have to use the rigid catheter catheter with stilet and sometimes in ivf as i say it is very uh, very uh, few people they are doing this the transvaginal sonography so few patients i have encountered in my practice so they are having the very difficulty in negotiating the os so in that conditions we do the transvaginal sonography with the embryo transfer so that is the two consultants are required for that condition but so that is also very important so to negotiate dose we can see the uh, canal very easily and according to sonophic guidance we can negotiate dose so definitely that is one of the indication we when you cannot negotiate the os instead of catching the cervix with the tenaculum or with the this things so alice so instead of that you can do the per abdominal sonography and you can negotiate the os in a number of cases also thank, thank you sir, sir. number of follicles we require for for, for getting good getting result, good result. I, I, I i not got your question sir number of follicles number of follicles to get good to results get good results okay okay so ideally if you ask me sir a single follicle mono follicular growth is also sufficient when when you are we are doing the ovulation induction so ideally a 3 to 4 follicles and that is on the either side so total 3 to 4 follicles are more than sufficient but as a combination combination there is increased chances of fertilization of those oocytes so a 3 to 4 is an ideal for the ovulation induction with the iui okay thank, thank you, you sir so any any question to anybody datta yeah i think most of the questions are over okay uh, thank you, thank you dr magogar for a very excellent simplified presentation where most of the questions have been answered i think uh, supriya wants to give some message supriya if you start walk if you stop walking we can hear you 
You have given us a complete tour of your house. Again, <laughs> now please sit in one place and talk, say whatever you want to say. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. First of all, my congratulations to Laul sir and uh, yourself and Nupur and Dr. Uh, Narhari for an excellent CME. So I think uh, that's a thumbs up for all of you. Uh, you. As you all know, this is now toxins. Please give your attention. As you all know, twenty eighth of May is World Menstrual Hygiene Day. So I on behalf that. of, sorry, sir. I said I didn't know that. Okay, I'm telling you now. And uh, on behalf of POGS, we are going to conduct an exciting CME also on that day. But first and foremost, we need pictures of each and every toxin. Hold a placard which shows your slogan, your pet slogan on menstrual hygiene, and uh, send a picture to me on my personal WhatsApp. We are compiling a video. It should not be that everybody's pictures have come and some of you get left out. So please take this as an urgent message. Our Sunday is. All of you free. सज दज के तैयार का एक प्ले कार्ड बनाओ अपना मेंस्ट्रुअल हाइजीन का मैसेज उस पर डालो एंड वो हाउ दोज हाउ द ये दिस वे कॉन्विक्स कैसे पकड़ के खड़े हो जाते हैं ना जेल वाले वैसे आप प्लीज अपना अपना प्ले कार्ड लेके खड़े हो जाइए एंड सेंड अ पिक्चर प्लीज सेंड इट टू मी ऑन माय पर्सनल व्हाट्सएप लास्ट डे फॉर सबमिशन इज नाइनटीन बिकॉज वी नीड सम टाइम टू कम्पाइल द वीडियो थैंक यू फॉर द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू गिव दिस मैसेज एंड फॉर The details of the menstrual hygiene day program. Please watch for your TOGS uh, WhatsApp spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Supriya, very much. I think most of our uh, young warriors are doing good work. Uh, thank you, Laul sir, for for the excellent webinar, and thank you, Dr. Nari, for an excellent presentation. I mean, you are getting a lot of thank you messages and excellent messages on your on the chat. I think it was a very simplified presentation, uh, uh, telling us exactly what we must do and when. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Nilesh, Nilesh. Thank you. Thank recording. Re yes, will, sir. Re recording is on. Yes, sir. Recording. I will need the link of the recording. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I forgot. I actually forgot to thank Nilesh of Nivyan Pharma uh, for giving us the educational grant for this for this webinar. He has been doing it for the last three four times now, and we are really thankful and indebted to him. Thank sir, you. Always Nilesh. most welcome. Most welcome, sir. Pleasure. Thank It's my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Tailor, why are you looking so grim? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, I think I, I I think we we can we can we can conclude the webinar. Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah.